Good day, it's Father Tom, and I'm glad to be with you today. I've been talking about persecution, and I'm uh, in the world, and persecution of the church, and that we live uh, in a place where we have religious freedom at this point, and uh, we don't use it. And you know, you know what they say about muscles? You don't use them, you lose them. And you don't use the religious freedom you have, you lose it. Let me just tell you this. This is a principle. I've never heard anyone say this principle other than uh, chemists and physicists. Nature abhors a vacuum. I've heard that. There's no such thing as a vacuum because something will fill it in when there's a vacuum. But I'm going to tell you, since the church has stepped aside, so much of the church, Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox, okay, in the proclamation of the gospel, in the proclamation of the lordship of Jesus, the church has stepped aside. The church has just, I don't know what we've been doing. That's a big vacuum. You know who's filling up the vacuum? Oprah Winfrey. Do you believe it? Oprah Winfrey has, I've heard her say on YouTube that Jesus Christ is not the only way to God. There are many ways to God. And you know, as long as it feels good, Oprah is running her own religion now. At one time she was a Christian, but now she has forsaken Christ. Yeah, she's the high priestess of the airwaves now. Oprah Winfrey. You know what I say about her? She should have quit after she made the color purple. She should have quit. Because you know why? Because now she's lost. And the sad thing about her being lost is she's bringing with her so many people. You want to know why? Because the church has been so remiss in proclaiming the gospel and living the gospel and living the truth of Jesus Christ. We've been so remiss. We've, be, we've put on our religion like an overcoat and we take it off after the Sunday service. We've not allowed God to change our hearts. We've not allowed Jesus to change our hearts. So what happens? What happens? People are hungry. And if the church doesn't feed them food, then Oprah Winfrey will feed them swill. And they will buy it. Do you understand that? This is Oprah Winfrey, you know? One of the evangelists of the world. Last week she had a man on that was pregnant, but he wasn't really a man. It was a woman who became a man, and I don't know how sick can you be for ratings. How sick can you be? That's Oprah Winfrey. How has she fallen? I'm going to tell you it would have been better if she lived in Harlem in the poor, in the poverty dirt of the streets of Har Harlem and be a Christian than be a trillionaire and go to hell. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's very sad. Very sad. This happened in 1995. At 9 a.m. on May 24th, 1995, Cuban, Cuban police surprised Pastor Orson Villa at his home and took him as a prisoner. The next day, thousands of believers filled the streets in front of the government offices, protesting the unjust arrest. It was the latest move by Castro's government to implement a new law designed to close down house churches everywhere. Orson, who pastors a large house church with a congregation of 2,500 people, is also the superintendent of the Central District of the Assemblies of God Church in Cuba. During the previous four years, in an apparent opening up of religious freedom, the communist government permitted the development of these house churches. But upon seeing the unstoppable growth of new believers, they changed their point of view. The church in Cuba was in revival as never before. There were 85 new house churches in the area of Cagüe alone. The government leaders were furious and proclaimed that these house churches threatened the Cuban government. They tried to force the leaders, like Orson Villa, to close 
all the house churches. None of the churches were willing to close. Despite the tremendous demonstration of support by believers, Orson was not given a fair trial. His lawyer had an opportunity to provide a defense. On May 24th, he was sentenced to one year and nine months in prison. Twenty-three years ago, Brother Orson gave up his medical career to dedicate himself full-time to preach the gospel throughout Cuba. Since that time, he has been an evangelist and the leader of the Christian youth and the national advisor of youth. He has been imprisoned and threatened various times. His story reached believers around the world who prayed for him, his family and his church. On March 2nd, 1996, he was released early and placed under house arrest. Imagine, he was a doctor. He left his profession to preach the gospel. You might say, but he's not Catholic. He's my brother. Anyone that go to jail for Jesus Christ is my brother. I don't care what, what label is on him. This is a man that suffered for the Lord. Do you suffer for the Lord? Do we suffer for the Lord? You don't even get your children to get to church. You don't get your children to get to church. You don't, you don't even, you know, you don't bring them to church. You know, you're, you're, just, just, you're, you're just too wrapped up in, in the kingdom of kingdoms. You've been taught that the world is going to save you, and the more you have is the better it is, and that's all it is. It's about having more and more and more and more. But I'm telling you, it's not having more and more and more and more, because you know what? Less is better. Less is better. Less is better. When we were poor as children, we didn't even know it. We had everything we needed. We had family, we had friends, we had cousins, we had good food, we went out, we went on picnics, we sat, we, we played Relivio, we did all these things. Now we have kids that have everything plus everything, and they sit before a computer doing nothing. You have to pay for, for their sports. You've got to pay to have them do things. There was no paying about for us. We played with rocks, we played with we played with marbles. We, we had fun. We, we, would, we would be with each other and we would enjoy it. And people don't have friends anymore. That we were all too busy. I, my son's got to go do this and I have to pay this and he's on karate and, and he's in the swim team. And he, we had no swim team. We went to Shays Beach. That's where we went four, five, six times a year. That's where we went. But we had much more than the young people do today. We had God. We had, we had each other. We had family. We had friends. We had relatives. Now we have things. And we don't even know our next door neighbor anymore. Now we have things and our children. Our children are pagans. We haven't even brought them up as Catholics and as Christians. We haven't brought them up. Thank God there are exceptions. Thank, and I know in my church there's been about five or six exceptions that have brought their children to church, seven exceptions, eight exceptions, ever since they were babies. And these children are superior, I'm telling you, in every area, every area they're superior. We have Christina Lassard who, who, who has come to church every single week. Now this, this young girl is, is in the in college, and she's on her way to Australia to do missionary work this summer. Let me tell you, it makes a difference when children go to a church where Christ is preached, where they are prayed with, where they see God doing things. It makes a difference. It makes a big difference. If you came to our Holy Week services and saw these altar services, and they all happened to be boys because the girls didn't want to come this year. I'm going to tell you, they were most reverent, most beautiful. And they were so, they're, they're always, always an example to me. These children, they're beautiful children. And they came not because they were coerced. They came because they wanted to come. And they came the whole three nights. And our services are long.
We've given our children everything, and we've not given them our faith. It's all about materialism, you see. It's all about the kingdom of kingdom. It's all about, it's all about the more you have, the better it is. No, less is better. Less is more. Less is more. We had nothing. And you know what? We didn't even know it. We had nothing, and we didn't even know it. You want to know why? Because we were happy. We had each other. We had relationships. We, 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 we had the church. When I was a child, the church was the center of the neighborhood. I didn't go to parochial school, but the church was the center of the neighborhood. People identified with the pa parish they belonged to. Where are you from? I'm from Sacred Heart. They don't even know the name of the parish anymore. I've been to different places like looking for churches because I was going to be preaching there. And I said, do you know where the Immaculate Conception Church is in Salem? They looked at me like I had seven heads. No, we don't know that. But So I said, no, it's just, this is just kind of one person. You ask several people, I don't know where it is. It's the biggest church in Salem. That's how bad things have got. Oh, but they had all good sneakers on. Oh, yeah, they had the best sneakers, and their hats were on backwards, yeah, just like everybody else. Wonderful. No faith. Pagans. We've raised pagans. But when the Great Depression comes again, we better find our knees before, because it's going to be too late. You say, what Great Depression? could never happen again. Oh, no. We're in the middle of a recession. Gasoline's going to go up to 4 or $5 a gallon. You watch it. Fourth of July, you watch how high the price of gasoline will be. You just watch it. But not only gasoline, my friends. It's not only gasoline. Have you looked at how high groceries are? Everything's gone up. I do my own shopping. I see it. How high meat is, milk, eggs. My Lord, my Lord, what is it going to take for us to get back on our knees? I read a book many years ago, at least I, I saw the cover of the book. It was called Tortured for Christ by Reverend Richard Wurbrand, a German Lutheran martyr. Listen, one by one the priests and the pastors of Romania stood and offered words of praise for communism and declared their loyalty to the new regime. Their statements of unity, propaganda for communists, were broadcast to the world over the radio direct from the parliament building. It was a year after the communists had seized power in Romania. The government had invited all religious leaders to attend a congress at the parliament building. Over 4,000 religious leaders attended. First they chose Joseph Stalin as honorary president of the congress. Stalin killed millions and millions beyond Hitler. Then the speeches began. It was absurd and horrible. Communism was dedicated to the destruction of faith, as had already been shown in Russia. Yet bishops and pastors arose and declared that communism and Christianity were fundamentally the same and could coexist, just like a lamb and a lion could coexist. I doubt it. Out of fear, these men of God were filling the air with flattery and lies. It was as if they spat in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sabina Wurbrand could stand it no longer. She whispered to her husband Richard, stand up and wash away this shame. 
from the face of Jesus Christ. Richard knew what would happen if I speak, you will lose your husband. Sabina replied, I do not wish to have a coward for a husband. So Pastor Warbrand took the stage to everyone's surprise. He began to preach. Immediately a great silence fell on the hall. Delegates, it is our duty not to praise earthly plow powers that come and go, but to glorify God the Creator and Jesus Christ the Savior who died on the cross for us. A communist official jumped to his feet. This would not do. The whole country was hearing the message of Christ proclaimed from the rostrum of the communist parliament. Your right to speak is withdrawn, he shouted. Warbrand ignored him and went on. The atmosphere began to change. The audience began to applaud. He was saying what they all wanted to say, but they were afraid to say it. The official bellowed, cut that microphone. The crowd shouted him down. The pastor, the pastor, the pastor, they chanted. The shouting and the clapping went on long after the microphone wires were severed and Richard Warbrand had stepped down. The Congress was ended for the day. After this, Pastor Warbrand was a marked man. On Sunday, February 29, 1948, Pastor Werbrand was on his way to church when he was kidnapped by a small group of secret police. He tells what happened next. I was led to a prison 30 feet beneath the earth where I was kept in solitary confinement. For years I was kept alone in a cell. Never did I see the sun, the moon, the stars, flowers. Never did I see a man except the interrogators who beat and tortured me. Never did I have a book, never a bit of paper. When after many years I had to write again, I could not even remember how to write a capital D. To make the feeling of isolation worse, the prison was kept completely silent. Even the guards had cloth shoes so their steps could not be heard. When we were first put in solitary confinement, it was like dying. Every one of us lived again his past sins and his neglecting of duties. We all had an unimaginable pain in our heart, thinking that we had not done our utmost for the highest, for the one who has given his life for us on the cross. I was in the depths of this remorse and pain when suddenly the wall of the jail began to shine like diamonds. I have seen many beautiful things, but never have I seen such beauties which, which have been seen in the dark cell beneath the earth. Never have I heard such beautiful music as on that day. The King of Kings, Jesus, was with us. We saw his understanding, loving eyes. He wiped our tears away. He sent us words of love and forgiveness. He knew that everything which had been evil in our lives had passed away, had been forgotten by God. Now there came wonderful days. The bride was in the arms of the bridegroom. We were with Jesus Christ. We didn't know we were in prison. Sometimes when we were beaten and tortured, we were like St. Stephen, who, while they threw stones at him, did not see his murderers, did not see the stones, but saw heaven opened up and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. In the same way, we didn't see the communist torturers. We didn't see that we were in prison. We were surrounded by angels. We were with God. We no longer believed about God and Christ and angels because Bible verses said it. We didn't remember Bible verses anymore. We remembered about God because we experienced Him. With great humility, we can say with the apostles, what we have seen with our eyes and what we have heard with our ears, what we have touched with our own fingers, this we declare to you that you may have joy and faith. After years of solitary confinement, we were put together in huge cells, sometimes with 200 or 300 prisoners in each cell. I will not tell you the whole truth because you could not bear to hear it, but this I will tell. Christian prisoners were beaten, tied on crosses for four days and four nights without interruption. The communists then stood around them, jeering and mocking. Look at your Christ, how beautiful he is. What fragrances he brings from heaven. Then they kicked the other prisoners, forcing them to kneel down and to adore and worship this besmeared living crucifix. Then worse times came, the times of brainwashing. Anyone who has not passed through brainwashing can't understand what torture it is. From 5 in the morning until 10 in the evening, 17 hours a day, we had to sit 
perfectly straight. We are not allowed to lean or rest our head. To close our eyes was a crime. Seventeen hours a day, we had to hear communism is good, communism is good, communism is good. Christianity is stupid, Christianity is stupid, Christianity is stupid. Nobody believes in Christ anymore. Nobody believes in Christ anymore. Give up, give up, give up, give up. For days, weeks, and years, we had to listen to this. Finally, the worst came. Communist torture. Those who believe in God with red-hot iron pokers, with rubber truncheons and sticks, and all kinds of methods, Christians were tortured by the communists. And then the miracle happened when it was at the worst, when we were tortured as never before. We began to love those who tortured us just as a flower, when, when you bruise it under your foot, rewards you with perfume. The more we were mocked and tortured, the more we pitied and loved our torturers. Many have asked Pastor Warbrand, how can you love someone who is torturing you? He replies, by looking at men, not as they are, but as they will be. I could also see in our persecutors Saul of Tarsus, the future apostle St. Paul. Many officers of the secret police to whom we witnessed became Christians and were happy to later suffer in prison for having found Jesus Christ. Although we were whipped as, as Paul was, and our jailers, we saw the potential of the jailer in Philippi who became a convert and his family. We dreamed that soon they would ask, what must I do to be saved? It was in prison that we found the hope of salvation for communists. It was there that we developed a sense of responsibility to them. In communist prisons, the idea of Christian mission to communists was born. We asked ourselves, what can we do to win these men to Christ? The gates of heaven are not closed for the communists. Neither is the light quenched for them. They can repent like everyone else, and we must call them to repentance. Only love can change the sinner or the terrorist. This is what you call real Christianity. This is what you call, I found someone worth living for, someone worth dying for. This is what you call people becoming living sacrifices of praise. Then we look at ourselves. We live in luxury. Even if we live on the street, we live in luxury. I tell you, there's more faith on the street than there is in the churches. You want to know why? Because you know, when you live on the street, you've got to depend upon God. Because people steal from you, beat you. And not everyone on the street is a drunk. For two weeks now you've heard about people being tortured for Christ, people giving their lives for Jesus, persecution in the church. Like what do you do for the Lord? How bright is your witness for Christ? Do you bring your children to church? Do you read them stories from the Bible? Do you pray with them? Today we have freedom. We will not always have it. Believe me. We will not always have it. Because when you don't use something, you lose it. If we ever needed faith more than ever, it's today in 2008. And yet churches are closing. Catholic schools are closing. But Islamic centers are opening. Islamic schools opening. We live in a post-Christian era because we've been a comfortable people with no faith. What the church needs is a good persecution. You know what I hope happens? I hope, first of all, they take our tax-free number away from us. 
then we will be obligated to nobody. The Pope is coming soon. You know what's going to happen, don't you? There'll be thousands and thousands of people to go greet the Pope. But who will listen to his message and live it out? That is to follow Jesus Christ. Who will do it? Even unto death. We have no idea what's coming down the road. And we're not prepared, economically and spiritually, psychologically and emotionally. These are the days to find your knees. These are the days to find your knees. These are the days to find your knees to open up your Bible and to get back to church, get back to Christ before it's too late. Do you hear me? I never could be more serious. These are the days. Don't wait. May Almighty God bless you and change you as well as me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God bless you.